something is wrong if all we're doing as readers is uh, highlighting our favorite parts of the books and then clipping that information and storing it in a second brain tool like Notion or Obsidian. There should be so much more we're doing with that information. Today, I'm going to give you a quick uh, idea on how to change the way that you learn. If you do this one thing every day, you'll take that knowledge and you'll bring it to the very next level. Let's get started. Welcome to this week's episode of the Read Well Podcast. My name is Eddie Hood, and I'm your host, where I believe it's more important to read well than to be well read. So grab your favorite book, open up your notes, and let's get ready to learn something fascinating. Welcome to episode six of the Read Well podcast. I'm so excited about this, and I want to thank each and every one of you who have been listening and supporting the show. It comes out uh, every week on, let's see, Tuesday, it goes live on the podcast directories, and then Thursday, the video version of this goes out on YouTube. So if you're uh, an audio person, you've got one option. If you're a video person, you've got the other. And I just, I'm so incredibly grateful to uh, everybody who's begun to subscribe to the show support it and share the episodes we are trying to i i'm trying to build a community here it's just me <laughs> in my basement but i want to build a community of people who read carefully people who are not reading to have read but who are reading to understand and that is the crux of today's episode and i'm really excited about this one i i started off the show by saying that Something is wrong if we are simply collecting information as we read through our books. And this is where my frustration came. This is why I started this whole thing. As I was reading, I was, you know, clipping these highlights out uh, using so many different tools. I was storing those ideas in Zettelkastens or in online knowledge management tools from uh, uh, Rome Research to Notion to all these. I mean, they're all incredible tools. I love them all. But the issue was that I was, I felt like I got into this pattern where I was just, uh, reading and clipping and storing, reading, clipping, storing, reading, clipping, storing. And I was wanting to, there was so much that I was wanting to read that I never got time to actually be with the knowledge. I was simply generating the knowledge and storing it. And I think that's a, a real problem. Uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to be using Nietzsche today, the philosopher as an example, where he would spend a lot of time in the mornings uh, really reading carefully and writing carefully. And then he would go for a long walk throughout the day where he would be with his work and he would think, right? And it's that process of thinking that we're missing a little bit. So I'm going to create a new challenge today, something that I've been uh, doing myself for a short uh, period of time now, and it has really affected the way that I learn. And I'm calling it uh, just the, the daily note card system. You know, I, it's not, uh, <laughs> it is not a creative name. If you all can think of a better name, let's come up with that. But it's just a daily note card system. And I'll walk you through how that works today. But this is going to uh, affect the way your brain is making connections with what you're reading. And more importantly, it's going to affect how you engage with your knowledge. We've got to stop just storing information. We've got to start using it. So let's jump in to the first thought today and, uh, and uh, we'll get you started. So I went to, to college at the University of Utah. It was a great place to go to college. I got a degree in business there, and I uh, I loved every bit of it. But there was one class that we, as uh, as business students, feared more than any other, and that class was business law, <laughs> uh, for a couple of different reasons. Now, at the University of Utah, we are uh, it's it's a college where you uh, are, are essentially in giant auditoriums, especially for your undergraduate work. And there are 100 or 200 kids there. And I remember walking into business law that day and we had heard rumors of this class, you know, my, me and my colleagues, we knew this was not going to be an enjoyable process. We were just, we were just sort of like dreading this, this whole semester. And it was, it was said that you take uh, easy classes when you uh, go through business law, because it will consume you, it will ruin you. <clears throat> and uh, so we did. I mean, I can't, I think I took like Tai Chi or some sort of like martial art thing. I did. <laughs> and I took uh, some, something else that was very simple and business law. And it still, it wrecked me. And here's what happened. So we're sitting uh, in this big auditorium and there's well over 200 of us. And I'm with five or six of my, my, uh, my, my colleagues, my buddies. And the professor walks in and he's, I remember vividly seeing in my mind this stage down there. It seemed so far away because it was such a big room. And there was a small desk in the middle of the stage. And he walks in 
And this is an older gentleman, probably uh, you could tell he's been teaching it for a very long time. If he hadn't been, if he hadn't uh, retired yet, he probably should have. He was at that age, but he was so into the process of teaching business law that you could tell this man was going to do this for the rest of his foreseeable life. He thoroughly enjoyed it. And I don't know if he enjoyed causing pain to the students <laughs> or if he just really enjoyed law, but one of the, one of those kept him there. Uh, so, but here, here, here's how the class went. Uh, you know, up to that point in my education, I had gotten really good at learning how to make the educational system work for me. I learned how to play the game. It was a game of memorizing facts. So when you come into a classroom setting, you are given the syllabus, uh, uh, of course, uh, an arrangement of assignments that will be coming and when they're due. You're often given study guides or notes from the teacher. You can have study groups and all, all these things, right? All with the understanding that as long as you turn your assignments in on time and you can memorize the appropriate facts, which you can regurgitate on the test, if you're good at regurgitating, you will likely get at least a B, if not an A. And this skill had served us well, people. It had served us well until today. <laughs> when he walked in, he said these words, and I'm not, you know, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he said, there is no syllabus. There are no assignments in this class, and in fact, there is only one test. Your entire grade will be based upon your efforts in that one final test. And of course, we are all freaking out like, this is not fair. How could this be fair? You can't do that to us. And he said, before you panic, I will give you the test right now. So the very first thing he did in class was give us our final test. And he says, this is the actual test you will take. So now we're thinking, what were we scared of? This is awesome. We get the test right now. We get all semester to work on this thing. It's open book. We can look up stuff on the internet. He even encouraged us to go talk to attorneys and, and get their help with these questions. So we're thinking, oh, what were we scared of? This is going to be a breeze. Uh, I had almost rewired in my brain to go sign up for some other harder classes to get them done while taking business law, because I thought this is going to be a cinch. There was a catch. <laughs> uh, the test had five questions on it. That's it, five questions. These were not true or false questions. These were not multiple choice questions. These were the kind of questions you had to really understand business law in order to answer. You had to know it. You had to breathe it. You had to live it. And it took all semester long of us just working our butts off. We went and interviewed attorneys. We did everything we could. And it took everything we had to get you know, a C in that class. It was easily my worst grade in my entire college profession. I share that story with you because it's a great understanding of what happens in our educational lives and how we're approaching learning something new. And if you're in this community, you care about learning something new. Now, uh, you can you can do it one of two ways. You can, of course, do it my old way, which is to memorize facts, right? To um, to sort of regurgitate the things that um, make you feel like you know what you're talking about or make you look like you know what you're talking about. But at the core, you really haven't internalized or synthesized the information and you really can't use it. You've only memorized some stuff. Here's the worst part about my old uh, uh, my old way of doing things before this class. After I would memorize those facts and take the final, I would brain dump. It was it was always a common term. At the end, you'd walk out of your final, and every kid would say, all right, time to brain dump, which means I'm now going to forget everything I just learned because that feels good, and I'm going to make way for the next class and the next semester so I can fill my brain up again. If you've been to college, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And look, I, I have no, nothing against college. I'm grateful for my, my collegiate experience. However, uh, it did teach me that there's a difference between memorizing facts and understanding. And my business law class taught me that uh, if I truly want to be an educated human being, I need to approach it from the perspective of understanding. Uh, although I walked out of that class with a C, uh, I remember that class in more detail than any of my other classes. I got more out of it. I grew as a business owner, and I use that information in my own business today to help me make decisions that protect me and my employees legally. So it was well worth it, and uh, I, and I thoroughly encourage 
that style of learning. And that's going to follow into what we're doing today. Okay, so stick with me here. This is important. Now, I'm going to read something to you from, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just now digging into um, the basic writings of Nietzsche. This, this book, it's, uh, it's, it's translated by Walter Kaufman. Uh, if you've uh, been online and found any of uh, these books here, uh, this one pops up a lot, and uh, I, I'm just now getting into um, these writings myself, and I'm very excited to do this. But I thought, you know, before I start in just reading um, um, Nietzsche's work, I wanted to sort of prepare my brain for uh, what I'm getting into so that I can understand it better. And in the introduct in introduction to um, on the genealogy of um, uh, of morals. There is this section here where the editor uses a phrase called galloping consumption is a disease. Now, this will apply to the note card method. This will apply to storing uh, information in our Zettelkasten or our Notion or our Obsidian or wherever. Okay, uh, so, so pay attention here. Now, if you're driving, uh, <laughs> you can continue to drive. Just listen gently and, uh, and, and come back to this later. But listen to what the editor says. He's talking about Nietzsche's style of writing and how um, Nietzsche had this, what he calls a pathological weakness for one kind of ambiguity. And what he's saying is that Nietzsche often liked to use words that have a dual meaning and in doing so uh, can throw readers off. And unless you read Nietzsche carefully, you're going to miss the underlying valuable meaning and you'll take the more superficial meaning, which is usually incorrect. So listen to this. Nietzsche had an almost pathological weakness for one particular kind of ambiguity, which, to be sure, is not uh, uh, irredeemable. He said he loved words and phrases uh, that mean one thing out of context and almost the opposite in the context he gives them. He loved language as poets do and relished these revaluations. All of them involve a double meaning. So I'm going to skip down here a little bit. It says, okay, the former is bound to lead uh, hasty readers, browsers, and the rapidly growing curse of our time, the non-reader who do not realize that galloping consumption is a disease. These people will be led astray. So what he's saying here is that if you're the kind of person who uh, is going to be a hasty reader, if you're simply going to browse things or to rapidly try and get through books, you're going to uh, be subject to the greatest curse of our time, which is that galloping consumption is a disease. And what he's, what he's speaking about here is that like, if you're just trying to like read just to read and you're trying to get a hundred books in this year, or 200 books in this year, which um, I can probably put a link to the, our, our first podcast episode in the YouTube video, uh, at least and I'll put it in the show notes as well. Or I'm talking, I'm speaking out against this idea that to read 200 books a year is kind of ludicrous. I don't believe in that. I don't like that hustle culture of reading. And the editor of this work here is agreeing and saying that it is becoming a disease of our time, that we are, we are uh, missing the actual meaning of the books. We're just glazing over them. Now, here's where it gets really cool. Listen to this. He says, the body of knowledge keeps increasing at incredible speed. But the literature of non-knowledge grows even faster. Books multiply like mushrooms, or rather like toadstools. Mildew would still be more precise. And even those who read books come, um, come pre-forced to depend more and more on knowledge about books, writers, and if all possible. For this is the intellectual, or rather the non-intellectual equivalent of a bargain movements. As long as one knows about ex existentialism one can talk about a large number of authors without having actually read their books all right translation time what he's saying here is you guys books are just like increasing knowledge is increasing people are writing stuff uh, you know just they're just it's multiplying and he used the uh, idea that books are starting to multiply at the rate of what mushrooms or mildew would do and he uses that word very descriptively in saying that like um there's a lot of stuff being written and it's not all good, <laughs> right? And you have the ability to uh, go out there and learn about these books without actually having read them. And people are doing that now, aren't they? They're using Cliff Notes and, and Spark Notes and, um, and other tools online to give them the Cliff Notes version of a book so that they can 
pretend like they've read it or, um, or, you know, be able to talk about the idea. But it goes back to that idea of being in college where all we're doing now is learning facts. We're memorizing facts. So if, for example, if you wanted to learn about um, Nietzsche's work, you could go on to chat GPT and have chat GPT tell you a summary of his essays and writings. You could read that in a few minutes and, and now you know something and you could speak to Nietzsche's work. However, uh, if we were to take the time to actually read his work and think about it and study it, then uh, we would we would truly be able to sort of ingrain it in our lives, much like that law class did for me. So remember that to move quickly, to gallop in your consumption, to go as fast as possible and read as fast as possible is becoming a disease. And so I'm going to give you a challenge today and a tool that will slow you down. Uh, and remember, slowing down is a good thing, right? A lot of people online are, are, are leaving notes of like, uh, or leaving comments of, you know, I, I take notes, but it slows me down. And I don't know that I like that. I, I've got so many things I want to read. My argument to you is I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> There's a million books I want to read too, but it is better to read one book well and to improve our lives from that than to read a thousand books quickly and have very little to show for it. All right. So here's my challenge to you. I call it the one note card system. Very good title, of course. It is just a three by five card. Okay. And I'm holding one up to the camera here for the people on YouTube. And you, you have done these in your own personal life before if you've gone to college or high school. It's really, do you remember when you would have a final test? And I know this kind of is going to speak against my college example here uh, a moment ago, but, but stick with me because it will make sense. When your teacher would tell you that you had a final coming up and they would give you, um, let you bring in a cheat card. A cheat card would be a three by five card and you could cram as much information as possible onto that card and you were allowed to bring that card with you into the exam. That was like, oh, awesome, thank you. And when a teacher did that for you, it actually made you a better student because you now had the ability to go out and research with intent to find the information that truly matters to you and then to fit that on a three by five card. And there's a couple of reasons why I love this idea. And, and we're going to go through this uh, application uh, in a unique way today, but we're essentially going to be creating a cram card once a day, once a day for our writing. We're going to create a cram card for our life, and we're going to figure out how to use that. So uh, let's start off by saying why a three by five card. I love the fact that these are not huge full pieces of paper. You remember wishing when you were in college or high school, wishing that the teacher would just let you have a whole page to do this on, right? But the magic in having a three by five card is you have to get very succinct with the knowledge. You, you only put information on here that is truly critically important because you don't have room <laughs> to write um, anything sort of fluffy on here. You have to be very clear and very precise with your information. And so you go through your reading of text and you're really asking yourself critical questions of, uh, is this statement important? Why is it important? When will I need it? How will I need it? Is it worthy to fit upon my three by five card? See, if you have a whole page of notes, that is, um, that, that gives you more room to kind of wander. And if you have an entire Notion account or an entire Obsidian account, my goodness, now you can just capture, copy, capture, copy, you know, and just do that a thousand times and capture everything. And it's just a giant nightmare. I've, I don't know if, if, if you have a knowledge management system right now, but if you go back and look at it, my guess is there are probably, um, several entries into your, into your, um, your personal knowledge management tool that maybe don't need to be there, that aren't as interesting or as valuable as you thought. You just captured them because you thought maybe one day you might need that. Well, that's not really what we're looking for here. Okay. We don't want to be a filing cabinet. We want to understand the information. All right. So know this, we're starting with a three by five card because it has constraints. It's a beautiful little piece of paper. Uh, here are the rules of the game. You get to write on both sides. Uh, you are encouraged to, to write uh, as small, but as legibly as possible, because this card will be used by your future self. You're going to keep these cards and they're going to live with you for the rest of your life. Now, you can keep them in a small filing uh, box or bin. We don't want them to live there. 
But for purposes of organization, you can do that. You can also transcribe these into your personal knowledge management tool online and, and move them over to Notion or whatever if you want to do that. Or you can use a tool like I've built uh, called Highlightish. Uh, Highlightish.com is another tool that allows you to make uh, better book notes and then uh, use those notes for better writing. Just go check that out, Highlightish.com. Okay, so we've got our little three by five card. Now, uh, you're going to buy a stack of these uh, online on Amazon. They're super cheap. And then once a day in the morning, you're going to grab a fresh three by five card blank. Now, I want to start off by saying this. That gets me giddy. The fact that it's blank, it's clear. Let me grab a clean one here for you. Uh, so if you're watching on YouTube, a clean and empty three by five card is a beautiful thing because that is a space for what you're about to learn. It's like the possibilities are endless for what's going to end up here by the end of the day. I love that. I It makes me want to learn. I look at this empty three by five card and I'm like, oh, what am I going to fill this up with today? What am I going to learn? And you'll notice that that instinctively gets me asking questions, knowledge related questions. What am I going to learn? Right? So I like to keep these uh, note cards on my desk. I've got a whole stack of them sitting here. And every morning when I wake up, I see them and I start to feel that tingling sensation in my skin. It gets me excited for the day, to be honest. It tells me I'm about to learn something cool, whether it's from Nietzsche or whether it's, you know, uh, brain science or, you know, fitness related information. Doesn't matter. Some, sometimes I'm not in the mood to read philosophy. In fact, I have to be in a very specific mood to read philosophy. I might be reading something very light for the day. What matters is that I'm reading something that uh, um, moves me that is for pleasure and that I'm interested in. And this blank three by five card is a representation of what I get to learn today. A little side note here really quickly. Uh, I, I, I read something recently and I can't remember the reference, so I'm not going to try and capture it. But the idea was this, that learning uh, is, um, is a privilege. Learning is a privilege and uh, being able to educate yourself in today's society is an honor where you know all of our ancestors that came before us did not have either the access to education or the time because they had to be out on the farm all day long. They didn't have AirPods that they could listen to audiobooks. They didn't have um, easy access to libraries and books for nine dollars and ninety nine cents. Uh, they didn't have uh, you know online tools to help them explore knowledge and have knowledge management tools. Are you kidding me? Heck no. They were simply trying to get food on the table or to you know um, survive their oppressors. So yes, knowledge is a very um, it's a gift, right? Your ability to educate yourself is a gift. So let's let's remember that as we do this today. Okay, back to the topic. So we are going to embrace this card's constraints, the size, the fact that it is a small thing, and we're going to um, use that to our advantage. That is the next idea here, using the smallness of this card to our advantage. All right, so here are the rules of the game, like I mentioned before. You're going to start with a uh, asking a question at the top of the card. You're going to write your question down. And I, I like to, uh, so all three by five cards, usually, if, if you get the lined ones, there are it's got a bunch of blue lines, and then at the top, there's a, a red line, right? Uh, but there's this kind of wide, uh, wide open space at the very top. I use that uh, to write my question for the day. So know this, I'm not going to just put anything and everything I find interesting on my card because then I might have a card that is talking about an interesting recipe I want to make. And then another a part of the card might be talking about how to get better at work or, you know, it's a very unfocused card at that point. This is not a journal of the day. The point here is to explore in detail a quality question throughout your day, right? So as you pick it up in the morning, your job first and foremost is to consider what you want to learn and to ask a very specific quality question related to that topic. So, for example, today's card, I wrote, what did Nietzsche attempt to accomplish with On the Genealogy of Morals? So before I read On the Genealogy of Morals, I wanted to understand what is he trying to accomplish here? So I read through all the introductory text, the editor notes. Uh, I did some research online. I read through other books to try and figure out what on the genealogy of morals is even about, uh, what what the background is, what I should be getting ready for, how I should think about it. 
I wanted to know that before I started reading it. And so that was my question for today, right? I wrote that at the very top. I wrote a Q dash, what did Nietzsche attempt to accomplish with on the genealogy of morals? And then next to that, I write the date in the top right-hand corner so that I can flip through these easily and find the date. And then below the date, I write the topic of what I'm studying for the day. So this would be philosophy, right? Uh, so that's what the top of this card looks like. The rest of the card, as you can imagine, looks like a college cram sheet. It is small text, uh, images. I, I try to draw visual images of things if and where I can because that helps me learn uh, quicker or more in depth, at least, not quicker. And uh, of course, I'm writing on both sides. So uh, by the end of the day, I will have a card written out in detail, answering a specific question. Now, why is that interesting? A couple reasons. Number one, this is a card of knowledge I did not have yesterday. This is something I now know and have taken the time to research and write out by hand the answers to a specific question. I find that very encouraging. Uh, you know, the, the longest journeys, the most complicated, hardest journeys, as we all know, begin with a single step. And you achieve those journeys step by step. And anybody will tell you that to do something great, you don't do it in one big swoop. You do little bits every day and they build and build and build until a week, a month or a year later or 10 years later, you have a monumental project you've completed that uh, is just sort of uh, incredible, right? Nobody, nobody does uh, great work in one single step. It takes little chunks at a time. I often laugh at people who uh, um, think, darn it, I'm going to go on YouTube and get 2 million followers and, and be a millionaire. <laughs> uh, especially now that I've been doing YouTube for a little while and you, you learn how incredibly hard it is to earn your community's trust and to uh, earn that subscriber that, that uh, will trust you with their time on, on YouTube. That takes a lot of effort and a lot of time to, to get to even 100 subscribers or 1,000 subscribers. And so that is such a great example, though, that I think we can all relate to of how do these people get 10 million followers? You know what? They did it each and every day. They made a single video. They cared. They showed up. They answered comments again and again and again and again until 10 years later, they've got a million followers. This is how it works. Knowledge is the same way, right? And if you can, if you truly want to understand something, this is a great way to do that is to pick one note card and fill it with a specific question. Now, I want to share something that I think is important. Uh, it, it, is, it is a good time to ask, well, what question should I ask of myself each morning? Uh, if you know a gentleman in the self-help, self-development uh, industry, his name's Tony Robbins. Most people have heard of him. He's, he's often quoted as saying the quality of your life is dependent upon the quality of the questions you ask of it, which means if you ask crappy questions about your life, you're going to live a crappy life. <laughs> if you ask great questions of your life, you'll add a very interesting, very powerful life. That's what he's getting at. And that's what, uh, what I want to encourage you to do today as you start with your note cards. Begin your morning with a blank card and start thinking about questions. What do I want to learn today? Why do I want to learn it? And start, you might go through three or four cards as you write your question on the top. And your goal here is to say, nope, that's not a good enough question. Nope, that's not a good enough question. And you're trying to refine it. And a good question achieves the following ideals. Number one, it's very specific. So you wouldn't want to say, for example, um, uh, why should I read Nietzsche, right? I mean, you could ask that question, but a better question like the one I asked is, was what was he trying to attempt with a specific book, right? That means I've got to go out and learn about that book, figure out what he was reading and, and, uh, and writing about and so on. And it gives me something specific to jam on. Also, your, your question needs to be very specific to you and your personality and your interests. You want to make sure that the question is strong enough that it propels you through the day to continue thinking about it and wanting to learn about it. If it's a boring or open-ended question or, uh, or not open-ended, that's the wrong term, but if it's um, ambiguous and not related to you, it's going to fizzle out as you sort of get busy through the day. You'll stop thinking about this question. All right, so that is the one note card method. Now, if you do this every day for 30 days, then in one month, you'll have 30 
specific note cards of knowledge that you've attained and that you've built up. You will be more knowledgeable further ahead by 30 paces. And if you think about that, how much better of a human being will you be uh, in terms of your passion and your production and your output because you've taken the time to take 30 steps and they are 30 focused steps, right? Your other option is just to like randomly read casually and hope you pick something up and take notes as it happens and so on and capture everything. Instead of doing that, let's get very specific and be very on purpose with our reading as we go throughout our day. All right. I want to thank each and every one of you for listening to the podcast. That is this week's episode. Now, before you leave, I want to give you a quick call to action if I can. Uh, again, thank you for, for supporting the community. Uh, I would encourage you to go to the readwellpodcast.com where you can subscribe for the newsletter. And then also don't forget to go to highlightish.com. That is the tool that I'm building right now. I learned how to develop software on the side. Uh, I'm an accountant by day, but I learned how to program so that I could build a tool that would help me make better book notes because apparently I geek out about this stuff and I truly, truly love it. So I hope this helps you and I will see you guys all on the next episode. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to take your reading to the next level, then head on over to our website at thereadwellpodcast.com. There you can get access to my weekly newsletter as well as up-to-date show information. Also, don't forget that I learned software development on the side just so that I could build a program to help us make better book notes as we read. If you're interested, go to highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add ish, I-S-H, at the end. Highlightish.com. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you on the next show.